you guys, welcome back. For those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Jennifer Bevins. I am a landscape designer in Vero Beach, Florida, but today we're in Stewart, Florida again. If you guys saw a previous video that we had, um, we did a backyard reveal for my friend James um, with some beautiful landscaping that we were able to complete for him as well as a water feature, or actually a few water features. Um, he has invited us back again and we are gonna do a tour of his front yard this time. I cannot wait to show you the front yard and some of the plant and tree choices that, uh, that we chose for the area. I think it turned out so lovely. You guys will have to let me know what you think in the comments. But um, yeah, so we're going to do the same as before. We're going to do a walking and talking tour, kind of letting you see what um, what I chose and maybe some reasons why. And just a little bit of info about the plant and the tree. That way, you know, that way it kind of creates a good shopping list for you guys. And, and hopefully it gives you a little bit of inspiration about what you might want to use for your own space. So um, please, if I miss anything, leave it down below in the comments with the timestamp on it. And I'd be happy to um, let you know what plant and tree uh, that is and whatever information that you needed about it. And speaking of good questions, I had a couple really good questions um, that were posted on the previous video that I definitely want to go over. So um, I will pick two and just kind of share those with you because I think that they're just great questions and I hope that it helps um, you guys and you know everybody watching. So we'll go through those in a second. For those of you guys who just want me to get on with it and move towards the tour, I'll stick the timestamp down below and uh, you guys can move right into the tour. But for the rest of you guys, hang on, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about plants and trees. Okay, so let's just jump right in. So the first question I have is from Karen Craner, 6700. Thank you, Karen, for commenting. Um, she says that she's new to Florida, and she said, so I started watching your videos to get some ideas. I absolutely love your designs, the knowledge you have, and the way you layer plants and trees, along with hardscape uh, features. is definitely a talent you don't see often. Thank you so much, Karen. That's, thank you, it's so sweet. Um, she said, we'll be moving to the Gulf side, um, so out of your area, and I was hoping you could do a video with um, tips or advice on how to find a great landscape designer no matter where you live. Great question. And Karen, that's the reason why I wanna do this, um, answer this question, because I get this so very often. And most of the time, when you're new to an area, you know, I think it it stands true to check reviews, you know, I, and no matter what, what professional you're looking for. You wanna make sure that a contractor not only can follow through with a project, but you wanna make sure that they, um, you know, they care about their reputation enough to where um, they're going to really work with each and every customer to make sure that everybody's happy. So you know that, you know, you know that that contractor is in good standing with community. Um, the second thing was, you know, their gallery page. That's got to be similar to your own personal style. So you can have a contractor who is a fabulous uh, landscape designer, but, you know, they lean more towards, you know, clean lines or um, very contemporary feel. And you might be heavy curves and tropical layers. And, you know, so no matter how great of a job they're going to do, it's not going to fit in with your own personal style. So I would say, and it's what I ask for all of my clients, I would definitely say um, pick Pick about five pictures, you know, whether it's Pinterest or Howl's or whatever idea book that you can find, or even, you know, go old school and print it out and um, share those pictures with your, your contractor as you guys are walking through the yard. You know, make sure that they really do understand what's important to you, what those styles are. Um, and that way, um, you know, that way they can tell you if, you know, they're gonna be a good fit for you. you know, they might say, that's really not my style and you might have a hard, they might have a hard time designing according to your own personal taste. So, you know, definitely pull some pictures and then pull about three pictures of I hates. I tell my clients if there's, there's three pictures that you just, this is not at all what you're looking for. This is not a style that you would prefer in any, any way. Then make sure you pick those because those are just as important because it really allows us to see, you know, the middle ground. It allows us to see where the connection is lost between the two styles. So, you know, pictures, uh, you know, say a thousand words. So, you know, definitely, definitely do that for your, your contractor. And I think you'll have better success with finding the right person. So we're going to go into the second question. So the second question is from YW Makeup. Thank you so much for commenting. She wrote, I love your content. I'm in Florida about to install landscaping on my house. Can you talk a bit about irrigation, how to plan for it, what types of plants need it, etc." So key things. Irrigation 
it, especially in Florida, it's super important. I mean, there's not many plants that really don't require it. You could probably do, do a drip line with certain plants that are more into the succulent uh, family. So things like a, a big Calusia hedge, if that's what you're looking for. Once it's established with maybe a drip line system, then you can turn that bad boy off and kind of let nature do its thing with some rains. Um, there are some tropicals that, that work through that, uh, or that work well with a, a drought tolerant situation. Pygmy date palms or robolinis do really, really well. All of these things after establishment, you can do um, you can do a, a low irrigation system. Most native plants, you know, jatrophas, uh, dwarf fire bushes, you know, uh, most of those kind of plants really can handle a tough, tough environment, so they can handle things like that. Bush daisies. Um, I'll try to um, list some natives at the bottom. Kunti palms, but um, you know you definitely want to make sure that you get them well established so that's the first 90 days after that 90 day time frame then you can water them once a week or count on mother nature for rain so um, so yes yeah, st so stick with your natives if you can or real drought tolerant trees if you're not going to have an irrigation system so if you are able to put an irrigation system in then um, I use the MP rotors um, I, I, I love the way they really really dial out a good amount of water they don't over water um, your plant material especially if you don't have a separate zone for just plants versus grass you know don't, they don't put out so much water where you know you're putting too much you're not putting enough water on your grass but you're putting too much water in your plants so they can really you can really dial those back and then um, it'll put the labels on the um, the heads themselves about the distance apart so you can put them every 10 15 20 feet just depending on you know how much coverage you need and then keep in mind Everything in Florida grows like crazy. So if um, if you're thinking about how high you need to install them, I normally always put mine at least nine to 12 inches. You know, I don't use the small heads very often unless, you know, it's for a low tier at the very, very bottom. And then I put a higher tier within the plant grouping. So if you have, you know, you know, like I like to do layers, you would want to put the, the, the lowest little six inch heads at the very front. And then you would want to put a tall stand pipe within the beds that spray up and out and cover both front and back areas. So, um, you know, if you've got good water pressure, then definitely, um, definitely make sure that um, you're putting in those taller heads because that, it makes all the difference in the world. And I'll see if I can post a picture of what it looks like with those tall heads going. So you really kind of get a, a general idea. At my house, I have extremely tall heads um, because I have so many layers of, of landscaping in the beds that I want to make sure it kind of looks like a rainforest out there. It kind of hits everything. So, and it is a straight, narrow path, so it's easy to kind of work with. But, um, but yeah, I'll put in some examples um, in the description um, or, or maybe I'll get Bryce to slide it in for you guys so uh, yeah but um, you know irrigation is important and I would make sure that during the summer months it's on every other day for about 30 minutes um, just depending on you know how much pressure and how much water you're getting but you want to make sure that everything is on a consistent pattern because plants and trees will grow the best when they know they're getting water getting fed just like humans at a certain time a certain day you know they just do so so much better you can really really see that shine in their leaves so so I would say irrigation is, is very very important um, in the landscaping world so well I hope that answers your question so we're gonna dive right into the tour and um, please you guys keep the questions coming I am so happy to um, answer a couple questions that might be a little bit longer that I don't actually get to re reply back into the comments um, so you know question away and I will do my very very best to get to them and and I hope this helps so all right let's start this tour all right guys so we are right here in the entrance way this is James's driveway um, if I if you turn around kind of show them where the gate is that'll give everybody a good point of reference of, of everything so um, this is coming right up to his driveway he's got a great podocarpus podocarpus privacy hedge here and then this is the entrance to the garden and I am in love with these mass trees you guys this um, this layered leaf, I don't know, it just screams out tropical. I love its silhouette. I just love the look of it. Um, it does a fantastic job of growing nice and narrow. Um, you do have to plant them somewhat close together to get this look, but I just think that they kind of really add a, you know, a fantastic, interesting wall. So um, they, they make such a nice, cool architectural detail in the garden. So I think they look great. Um, James had had this um, arbor already installed before we got started, so um, I think this Confederate Jasmine is doing a lovely job of kind of creating a nice and fragrant um, entrance to his front yard garden. So this front yard kind of wraps around and leads to his front door, and we'll kind of start walking that way. But you'll notice that, you know, this area, we did do two nice big islands. 
um, and we'll kind of go through what the plants and trees are within the islands. I'm going to miss some, you guys, because there's just a ton of material that we put in here, but I will list um, a lot of the highlights, a lot of things that are pretty easily and, and um, easy to find and, and readily available. So. Um, so we did a trio of foxtail palms here just to kind of give this some grandeur, to kind of give this more of an entrance feel. So these right here are foxtail palms and you can kind of tell, you know, from that cool crinkly leaf that they have and they offer that they really do kind of give you that fox's tail kind of feel. So, um, so I love them in a garden. They're just nice columns in, in, in a space. So. Um, this whole backyard is kind of framed with Calusia as the backdrop. Sorry, you guys, I probably should have started there so you knew where, where we were looking, but you can kind of see that Calusia. It's about, about 12 foot tall um, in places. It's really, really gained some beautiful size to it, and it creates a perfect, perfect border um, between him and his neighbor, which is kind of a nice estate-like feel. So. Um, so back to the foxtail. So we have a trio of those and then right to the left we have two as well. Um, we have kind of a similar outline for this bed here, but you can kind of see this is this is kind of framing the entrance to the space. So that way, you know, we've got a big punch of impact here and here and it kind of really leads you into this area. And you'll notice with most of my landscapes, I have a tendency to really work out from the edge of the property line and work my way forward so we can keep as much grass as possible you know this is this is prime real estate right here so um for for things that take you know um take too much of the grass they have to be they have to be pretty priceless you know so we want to we want to make sure that we keep the landscape in itself at the perimeter and leaving as much yard as possible so back into this bed here, the centerpiece tree is a blue Latin palm, and this guy um, is very similar to a Bismarck palm, but it stays more compact um, as far as a smaller overall tree. It won't get huge like the Bismarcks do. It's really gonna fit this position super, super well, and I'm just loving it. Being in Stewart, this is a great South Florida palm. You can carry it all the way into the Keys and, and even further south, obviously, um, but it's, um, it's just a great centerpiece palm. It has a fantastic fantastic silvery tone to the leaf and then it's kind of outlined with a little bit of a red tinge to um, to the outline to the leaf itself so very very cool frond very dynamic very fun and we pair it with something like this foxtail palm that um, kind of give you this crinkly soft weeping leaf and then you got something dynamic in the center I just think it really shows up so um, so I think it turned out cool the backdrop now these have been recently trimmed, but those are Java white copper leaves to the back. And then to the rear of those are um, red copper leaves also trimmed. So here only seeing pretty much stems on those, but um, they're really coming into their own for the summer. Here down below, we wanted something that's gonna stay nice and controlled around the front of this tree because this tree is gonna grow so slow. So these right here are Taiwanese Exorus. Um, they do great in this environment. They handle the salt, they handle the sun. They're just an overall tough plant. Now you can plant these guys in, you know, um, more of a shade environment. They can't handle full shade, but they can handle filtered light. So they go all the way up to filtered light, to partial light, to full sun, and they can do super, super well in all of those. Uh, salt tolerant and non-salt, so they kind of really blend in. The only thing they don't like is they don't like real mucky, mucky soils, so they do need some drainage in their soils. So make sure you place them in, in that grouping. But they bloom 10 to 11 months out of the year, and you just don't get much better than that. So I think they're an ideal little small compact plant, and they do this perfectly. You can pair them with plants that get big and lush and full, and then these are super controlled. So it kind of gives you that nice tapered, kind of pared back look, like it's keeping all the crazy to the back, you know? It's kind of keeping it nice and clean to the front. So, um, so that's what they do really, really well. And then we kind of just continued the Java White Copper Leaves as you see them to the back. Um, those leaves will continue to grow, um, not just in height, but in width. So by the time they're two years old, they'll be double the size. Each leaf will be double the size of my hand. I just love that big, giant, white leaf. They'll completely connect together, completely make a nice, bright colored backdrop. And you can see how dark it is back there. They're gonna do a great job of brightening that up. So, 
and then you can see I've got a tall 12-inch um, pop-up in the back that pops up an additional nine inches when it's turned on um, at irrigation head back there because I know those those plants themselves are going to get quite large so that's important for that to um, kind of you know make sure that we're going to get coverage there when they're fully grown and they're not going to miss out on coverage or get hidden back there down below here um, you'll notice that these are burl marks these kind of nice cool little weepy green pops um, these max out about three foot tall connect together they just kind of do a nice job again of giving us a little bit of a mix of texture here so they do a great job we got crazy fun big leaves then we've got um, medium-sized leaves that kind of kind of drape over kind of I guess like your hostas do I'm in love with the hostas from up north I think they're awesome I wish they grew here but these do a nice job of widening out and just becoming a nice little clustering plant like that and then of course now we're into the fine leafed small plants like these exoras which you know do another great job of kind of keeping everything controlled and again then again we've got the the golden dews that are in that same boat where they're just nice and tight you know controlled so kind of like what a boxwood would do for you we've got some little ruby reds down below just because when you have yellow, why not have purple? <laughs> it just does great. We've got some king sagos. We've got a king sago here and then another one flanking in the other island over there. And we have a very similar pattern in that, um, in that bed as well. Um, so the sago, the ruby reds, the dwarf exoras, and then the layers go up from there. So um, here we have some gold dust crotons. You guys know I love my gold dust crotons. This is a perfect environment for them. This mango tree literally just shades this whole little section right here and they just love this protection from it. Um, as you can see, this there's no shortage of mangoes in James's yard. <laughs> they're everywhere. So, um, so they're just tough. They can handle the droppage. They can just really, really, really do well in this filtered uh, light um, grouping. Right here I have just a few mango crotons. Look at the size of these leaves, you guys. I just think they're so tropical. Right, so if you wouldn't mind getting up close, this is an older leaf and you can kind of see how that red really just, really becomes a nice center and look how it starts with the yellow. It's just a cool tropical plant. Now those are a croton, but they can't really handle full sun. This is what they love. They love that filtered light. So they don't want full shade, but they do, um, they just need a little bit of protection. So you can really, um, <laughs> Bryce is pointing up at the mangoes up there because literally we're in the danger zone. Um, they could, <laughs> there's tons of them that can fall on us. So, uh, so I'm taking one for the team, you guys. Um, Bryce, just keep a lookout for me. <laughs> so um, to the back right here, these are Jamaican crotons. Um, which is, I know people cannot believe that that's a croton. Um, that leaf is just so beautiful. Now that can handle more sun than what it's in. It can handle this location with protection like this mango tree is giving it, some shade. But you can put this in a sun environment. They will burn the first couple months when you do that. So I always suggest do that in either early spring or in fall. You know, kind of give them a little bit of time to get adjusted to their environment in the full sun location. They will do well. The only difference is, is you're going to notice they're going to have more of a pink tone to that center. So this, this portion of the leaf will be a nice bright pink. But um, these have been recently cut, but you can really see how that stem is that really pretty red. I just think it's so gorgeous. And what a nice contrast between the yellow and the white. So these right here are called Pinwheel Jasmine. And I'm assuming you can tell why they're called Pinwheel. I love this bloom. This plant will bloom and flush out and become nice and thick and dense. Do me a favor, when you plant these, plant 10 at a time because when they grow together as a solid grouping, they're just gorgeous. They just really brighten up a dark spot. So they do so, so well here. And as you can see, these are really taking off and doing that. And Bryce, if you get this angle, you'll really be able to see kind of what they're, what they're doing together. I just love, love, love them. And they bloom all summer, all spring probably into early fall you know I haven't really checked them for that but I know that they are really show stoppers um, this time of the year so we've got Jabba white copper leaves and then again to the front we've got the pinwheel jasmine right here we have the mango crotons and what's so ironic is look at how how different these color tones are from one croton to another I mean that is just so vibrant and then you've got one that's more muted to the front so just depends exactly on how much Sun it's getting we have a false agave here 
And this is the female variety. The male has a darker green to it and less yellow, but um, a little bit more upright. So just depends on whether you're looking for something real strong and vibrant or you want that color that's more important to you. So they do well there. Now, these guys um, are in a little bit more sun and you can really see the leaves are nowhere nearly as large as the shaded mango crotons. So this is not full sun, but they do get a good amount of early afternoon sun. And then it starts to drop down around four or five o'clock, but they could not handle that five, six o'clock sun time frame. It's just too much for them. To the back, we've got some nice chunky gold dust crotons there. And then to the right of those gold dust crotons, we have ice tone crotons, which are so cool. They're darker when they're in the protection of the shade, um, but they are, um, they have a, a nice bright pink to them when um, they're in more of a sun environment. So this area gets sun all the way to three o'clock in the afternoon. So it gets good sun there. This, um, we're gonna come up to a, um, up to the waterfall feature, but backing the waterfall feature is a nice, giant row of Calusia as the backdrop and then we've got pygmy date palms to the front and that softens that Calusia it gives us that center bit of coverage there and you guys this garden has had a few months of really growing in and it's really starting to take off. This is its first summer, and but you can really kind of see what it's gonna do. I love those pygmy date palms. They're about, I would say about maybe tip in seven foot right now, but when they tip 10 to 12 foot, they're gonna be even more beautiful because they're gonna really branch out. Not only do they get taller, but they um, widen out a little bit. So that'll become a really heavy wall of fronds. Um, groupings right there and then the plants that are directly underneath of them grow to the Sanchezia grow to four to five foot tall so they'll cover up all of that lower section and then the um, burl marks in front of them the the green shiny um, plants will stay at that around that three foot section so they'll always be a rear tier of that water feature so flanking the water feature are two bottle palms those are triple bottle palms I think we all know how I feel about triple bottle palms. I, uh, if you love a single bottle palm, then why not do a triple? Cause you know, cause it's a triple. So they're absolutely so much fun to watch grow. They get wide and broad as they get older and they're just stunners in a garden and they're gonna max out at 14 foot. So they're never going to be the big section of this garden. They'll always be a great flanking tree. Um, they'll do a nice job of that. And then to the right here, the backdrop, we have three large foxtail palms that are full grown. And then directly under them, we have um, two triangle fan palms. So they're really doing a nice job of kind of giving us a little bit of variation of color. So we've got a little bit of silver in what's naturally a darker spot of the yard. So they're doing such a nice job. I love triangle fan palms because they have three flat sides. So you can plant them like a fan. You can plant them in a corner with a side. And um, you can really see, especially on, on this guy here, you can really see this cool Madagascar fur on them. And that becomes more and more pronounced the older they get. But what a beautiful tree. I love this weeping frond that they offer. I just think that they're just stunners in a garden. So they're gonna do so, so well. Again, we have Jamaican crotons. We, we have a Charlie Brown tree. No, I'm joking. That tree did not make it. It was a transplant from James's previous landscape. Um, but then we have some burl marks down below just to kind of cover up the equipment there. Whoops, sorry, Ruby Red. Um, and then we're just kind of tapering it off here with some gold mound or golden dew um, to kind of give us a nice clean look. So to the back, unfortunately, they're not in bloom here. Um, these are Brazilian red cloaks. They were about four foot when they were planted. So gosh, I bet they're about eight foot now. Um, they are still flushing out. They're still really getting into, um, getting into their position for this particular spot, but they make a great backdrop. They will bloom that beautiful red flower. Um, so we're, uh, we're kind of waiting for that to happen with those. Um, to the front are quarter lines. Those are Marie quarter lines. And they're really filling in that spot nice with the blast of color behind the bench. Just looks so magical back there. And then green Congos. 
can't go wrong with green Congos. Now they do need shade and some protection from the sun, but they do so well in a cluster like that. So I cannot wait to see them continue to grow and get that four or five foot range and wrap all the way around that tree. And what a great backdrop that's gonna be as far as photos and, and whatnot with those big giant leaves at four or five foot tall behind that bench. It's just gonna be, it's just gonna be stunning. So I can't wait to see that happen. So we have got a mix here. We've got the, um, the Jamaicans again, the Jamaican Crotons with a trio of hibiscus. These are double peach hibiscus, but they're not showing up in bloom for us today, unfortunately. So this right here, isn't it cool, Bryce? This is a cool screw pine palm. Um, it is a cool tree that just, the, it's a, it looks just like screw top, you know. It does have some thorns to the edges, so it's not as friendly as it looks, but wow, what a dynamic feature. And um, James commented often about how beautiful this looks at night with the light shining on it, and I imagine the shadow effect is phenomenal on this tree. If you need kind of a sculptural type of look in the garden, these guys do a fantastic job. And then we paired them with another sculpture in the garden to me, um, this traveler's palm. I just, you know, I know you guys probably see my videos and I try, I try to stick one of these in there every, every chance I get where there's not a pool or not anything that where the root system's gonna interfere. But I just think this is such a great backdrop. It's always at the very edge of a property where I put this because the roots are pretty invasive. So you have to make sure that you really are giving it the, the pretty, the, the, the proper position in a garden but goodness, they just make such, such a focal point. This is almost the first thing that you see from when you walk around the corner. You might look at the waterfall feature first, but then your eye gravitates this way. So I love this flat, just base. It's just so enormous. It's probably not coming through on camera, but the older it gets, the more you're gonna see this pronounced line. To me, it just looks like a work of art right here. It's just so, so cool. And then as it grows, that base becomes more eye line up here. So it becomes really what you see when you first look at the tree itself and those beautiful branches just fan out um, to kind of just scream, I'm in Florida, you know, plant me, I'm in Florida. So these are awesome. So traveler's palms. Um, oh, probably a question I got about traveler's palms before was, um, will they reproduce? And yes, they will. So they will kind of create a pup. It happens slow enough. So pop that pup off if you don't want it or transplant it and reposition it to another part of the garden. It doesn't happen like a lot of plants that reproduce quickly. So it's, it's you know, you might get one a year. So it's worth kind of just popping that guy off and putting them somewhere else or, or you know, donating them to a friend. Golden dews down below for some control. And then these guys, unfortunately, they're not, um, they're not really showing off right now, but these are firecracker um, copper leaves. And they really, I mean, they have a great fringe to the edge of their leaves. They've just been chopped back, so you're not getting their beauty, but this pink on the edges is just real flamboyant, really, really nice. Um, but you do have to cut those back pretty aggressively when you cut them back. So they're, they're a, a strong grower. So again, they've been cut back pretty harshly. Um, so you're not getting their, their full beauty. Now this um, dwarf screw pine, you can see it has a multi-trunk to it, so it's even more interesting. I just love the way it's opening up and looking, but it's got a very cool look to it. Very fun tree. And then we finished off this bed with another grouping of, um, another grouping of um, hibiscus double peach. Now these guys have been through aphids recently, so they've been sprayed and treated and um, they're, they're bouncing back. I can see all their nice little green leaf coverage to them, but they did take a hit, unfortunately. So, you know, but, and then we have um, ruby reds as the backdrop. So now we're at the front of James's house. So this is the front left side of his doorway. We have a double foxtail here to the left. We have a pygmy date palm to the back to give us a real whimsical backdrop. I just love how thick and dense they are. They're just so, so soft, so fun. And really, I think they always have a place in the garden. Underneath of the pygmy date palm is the gold dust croton. You can see that they get more protection from the sun. So those leaves are nowhere nearly as bright as the others, but offer just enough color and a dark spot. So how cool are they? Framed in the sun area where we have a little bit more sun, we have um, Mammy Crotons. Some people also call them Fireball Crotons for a good reason. 
I think they do a great job of becoming a nice low compact planting. Take little, little maintenance. Mammy Crotons are a tough, tough plant to work with. So they, they really, really show up and they, they do their job really well. To the backdrop, our Auntie Lou quarter lines. We're kind of letting those fill into that spot. And the centerpiece, of course, is the triangle fan palm. Now this one is pointed where the, um, the, I guess the triangle end or the corner is towards us versus a flat planting like on the other, in the other bed. But I really do like the way it's, it's framing as a centerpiece on this side here. So we did a um, rock water feature down below. This is a bubbling fountain. And it just offers a nice bit of sound, a little bit of, um, just a little bit of interest right here. And then these light up at night. So they have a really nice sound, really gives you a good look and just a low maintenance way to have some babbling sound of water um, at right by the front door. And it doesn't take up much, much room at all. We've got some Blue My Minds down below. And some um, ice. And this is variegated, or this is the green ice with um, the pink blooms. And it does a great job of crawling through rocks. So if you've got a spot that you just kind of want it to naturally crawl and make those rocks really look like they blend in, the ice plants do a fantastic job of doing that. And they can handle dry heat. So they're a great thing to work with without irrigation. The centerpiece plant right here is Blue Flame and it's an agave. Very, very cool. And then we kind of have a, a rinse and repeat here where we have the same crotons and it's just got, a, it has good balance and, and good symmetry as you get over to the right side of the bed. This tree right here is a Fiji palm and I just love this giant frond. Now this is a little tree with big fronds. So it, to me, it makes a great big impact. It's almost like a lime green, light colored, Palm and you really do notice it. When I peep around the corner, it is it really is striking. So I cannot wait. The older it gets, I'll see if I can I can get Bryce to post a picture of what it looks like when it's a little bit more matured. Stunning, you guys. They're just stunning. I have one at my house and I'm just I'm just in love with it. So that one um, can take the salt air, can take the warm climate, can take drought tolerant situations. The only thing it can't take is cold. So anything below 32 degrees. Eh not the guy for you unfortunately okay so um, burl marks are to the back this is an older um, imperialis bromeliad that James had originally we just reused in the landscape and then some more golden dew now these guys too they got hit with the aphids and we've um, we've treated them and they're just now coming back you can see all the new growth in them but unfortunately these are the Brazilian red cloaks that have gotten hit with some pests and um, they're going to be stunners and they were beautiful just a month or so ago. They were tall and thick and lush and really filled with that beautiful bloom. So, so gorgeous and I can't wait to see them do that again. But I'll have to see if I can put a picture in there for you guys. So um, in this bed, it's the last bed that we have. We have the centerpiece plant, which is an older um, silver odorata bromeliad. This was also in James's previous landscape, and we reused it in his garden as a nice centerpiece, and then put the burl marks just around it. So ice tone crotons to the back, and a gardenia tree to the front. Now, um, there's so many plants in this video. I mean, we've got some more hibiscus and some regitrophas and some coffee plants back here. Um, if there's anything that I've missed, and I, I know there is, because this, this yard can go on and on and on, and I don't want to make a two hour video for you guys. So please stick it in the comments down below, stick a timestamp there, and I'd be so happy to, um, to, to share those plants and maybe where I got them or a little bit of information that you guys might want from, from those. But right now we are gonna get out of this heat because it's literally, well, it's not 100 degrees, but it feels like 100 degrees. So we're going to get out of here. And we hope you enjoyed this tour and um, got some inspiration from it. And it's been, yeah, as always, it's just been so much fun. And thank you so much for, um, for, you know, visiting with me. I feel like I'm walking around, just taking my friends around, walking through the garden. So I hope you guys, um, hope you guys feel the same way. So I look forward to your comments, and I will um, see you in the next video. So take care. Bye-bye. I'm good. Good. Cool. All right. Um. Let us know if you like the Q&A right in the beginning of the video. We want to help answer some of your questions. Uh, so make sure you leave something in the comments. Make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that little bell so you get notified whenever we post. Um, 
there's anything else, let us know. Thanks, have a good one.